Hello everyone, in today's video we're going to be taking a look at the challenges of identifying things that are underwater. Now you're probably going, well that's pretty straightforward, I mean I understand it, like what, what's the deal? Well I thought what we'd do today is we'd actually bring in a little bit of Dangerous Waters, uh, for those who are not familiar with that game. It's a very very classic uh, submarine frigate, basically anti-submarine warfare game all in one, it's very sophisticated. but. Combined with command, it's kind of proved my point pretty well. So let's go ahead and take a look at what we have here. So I have the Sea Wolf that's uh, just sort of chilling here, uh, doing its little thing in the water. I'm going to go ahead and pause time here. It's going about five knots, nice and slow, and instantaneously, uh, you've noticed that we've identified three submarines. We haven't actually identified three submarines. The only thing we've done at this point is we've said there's three submarines somewhere along this bearing, which makes sense. Anybody who's played any uh, Silent Hunter games, you know, you stick the hydrophone in one direction, you listen for a while, and you go, oh, it's down that bearing. Good to know. So we're going to continue for just a few moments here as we start to work out the ambiguity of this particular situation by, with something called target motion analysis. With uh, TMA, basically all we're doing is we're trying to go, okay, how fast do we think it's going? Where do we think it's going to go? Where do we think it's going to be? And basically by doing the math, we're able to calculate roughly the course and therefore the position of the actual object. So you can see as I'm moving across time here and I'm taking new measurements, it's called a running bearing, I'm able to pinpoint the location of everything. Okay, perfect, stop. Now, you'll just notice here that I've identified one of the submarines. I've identified it with a combination. Remember, we have a big toad array on a sea wolf, which makes it a little easier. We're not sure of its position, but we're absolutely confident that it is a Delta IV submarine. So uh, knowing that particular piece of information, we can now say, oh, that's the one we're looking for and go sink it and stuff like that. But um, again, that's not really the point we're going for here. So I'm going to speed up time a little more so um, we'll get a little bit more detailed information. And probably saying, hey, that's not bad. So remember, I'm not using active sonar here, but I'm able to identify these three submarines pretty effortlessly. I'm also able to identify their depths. I'm able to identify everything about them that I possibly need to know. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and reset the scenario, and I'm going to make things a little bit more interesting for us. So we'll go back to green, grab onto these guys, and uh, we're going to slow them down. Now you're saying, well, obviously, if you go a little bit slower, you know, you're going to be harder to detect. Yes, not only are you going to be harder to detect, but you're also going to be vastly more difficult to identify. Now, this can be, like I said, kind of the point of what I'm saying here. So let's grab my sea wolf. Let's go ahead and unpause. I'll give him a few moments to kind of acquire what's going on. Notice the sea wolf has a fantastically sensitive sonar array on it. Um, I think it's incredible. I will take a look at it in dangerous waters in a moment. You can see just how effective it is. But we're having kind of, you know, the same kind of problem we had before. So we're able to identify it. We're doing some TMA here. We're having a pretty good idea of where everything is. Except for this guy up here. Uh, the reason we're having a tough time with him is because of the depth that he is actually you know, operating at. So it's making it a little more difficult for us to do our math. We knew he was there, but as soon as he slipped down to the proper depth, notice we're also having difficulty identifying their exact position. So I'll speed up time here. And whoosh, we were able to finally identify these two right away. And this one we're still waiting on just a little bit longer. So we'll give it a little bit of time and uh, identify it. Perfect. So you can see the distance was about halved, which again, nothing you're not surprised by in the slightest. So as you can see, as by traveling faster, not only are you easier to identify, but you're also easier easier to detect. Now, how does that translate? Well, let's uh, take a look. Boop! Ta-da! Dangerous Waters. Uh, for those who have not played this, uh, this is absolutely wild. I think I saw it for three bucks the other day. Like, it's not bad. Um, good luck getting working on Windows, in case you didn't notice that I'm in a window here. So, this is the same scenario. Um, I recreated it as close as I possibly could, down to, like, you know, the longitude and latitudes and everything like that. And I've even taken my little sea wolf, and I popped out the little toad array and everything, so we can see what it looks like. So, what I'm going to do is I'm going to unpause. And we're going to go ahead over to the sonar display. So our sonar display, uh, what you're seeing here, is this is basically the bearing. This is how loud things are on that bearing. So for example, on my 270 bearing, it's very obvious that there's something that's fairly loud there. Um, again, this is what they call a broadband display. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to switch to my toad array. And what I'm going to notice immediately is I'm picking up three distinctive sources of sound. I've got this one right here. Uh, this is at my 8 bearing. I'll go ahead and mark that one. I've also got myself another one right here. Uh, this looks like it's at a bearing of 30 degrees. I'll assign him a tracker as well. And I've got this one right here, who's also right there. So I've declared those three. So in essence, I've declared my three bearings. Now you're immediately going, uh, dude, um, they're over here, weren't they? You're absolutely correct. So but one of the problems we have, and again, I'm not going to get into this today, is the concept of bearing ambiguity. Whenever you use something that's circular, you basically run into a problem where when you're scanning stuff with it, you could actually have yourself a situation where you're actually detecting the inverse bearing. Now, the way we get rid of ambiguity is we basically turn really, really quickly, and that kind of snaps us around. So let's take a look at our condition. Ah, does this look familiar? Yeah, it does. You can see I have all these. As a matter of fact, I'm going to drop these. I know for a fact that these are all ambiguous bearings. So it's the same exact situation we were in a minute ago. We have 
have the three bearings. I can't remember, we identified them down that line here. So now what we have to do is we have to identify what they are. Obviously, we're starting our TMA process now. Um, somebody's got to go downstairs and they're going to run up. We're actually going to bring our course up to 360 here to uh, try to make it just a little bit easier to see what's going on here. Oh, I guess we're going to zero degrees. That's fine with me too. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to switch from broadband, which is how loud is the water, and I'm going to switch to narrowband, which is what does the sound of the water sound like? I know that sounds odd, but you can see we have ourselves these distinctive little blips of audio. Again, this is just background noise or water noise. So I come to this guy right here. I see this is a pretty big spike. I'm going to immediately assign him a tracker right there. Come over to this big spike right here, assign a tracker here, click on this one right here, assign a tracker here. So now I've got these three different positions I'm tracking. Now, what am I trying to do here? So if you take a look down here, you can see this is a basically waterfall display of the different spectrum. Think of it like a little spectrum analysis. What we're doing is we're seeing the different frequencies coming from that particular direction, and we can use those to identify what we're interested in. So if I were to come over here, for example, if I say I'll try out a, a Chia, okay, I'm looking for something at the higher frequency range. We're not going to pick up any high frequencies at this range. If I pick, uh, let's see here. I've only got these two possibilities. So again, delta four, if I look at the spectra, these are the two low frequencies. It's kind of that um, kind of low middle, and this is the higher, and this is the very high frequency. You can see very clearly that the expected spectra is identical to the spectra we're getting here. So I can say pretty confidently that we're probably dealing with a delta four submarine. So I'm going to go ahead and activate auto crew here, and I'm just going to go ahead and classify each one of these. Now, <laughs> yeah, of course, it's a flying airplane, right? No. It's a submarine. So we'll go ahead and do submarines. We come down here. We say it's a Delta IV. I'm assuming it's probably a hostile. I'm pretty confident about that. Boop. So then we come over here. We go ahead and classify this contact the exact same way. And again, notice this is exactly what happens inside of Command Modern Operations, except I don't have to do all the hard work here. Um, there's usually some guy on the ship that's taking care of this for me. Um, I do not see my Delta. I'm completely blind as always. There it is. Cool. Well, we're assuming it's hostile. And we're going to grab this one right here. We're going to go ahead and uh, classify this. Boop. <laughs> Or you can do that and I'll get rid of the contact, which now means we have to go find it again. But it's perfectly fine. But you can see that we were able to identify by how much noise it made. Now, I can go back in this scenario and I can reduce the speed of those targets. Watch what happens. All right, same situation. Uh, nothing's changed at all, except uh, my opponents now are going a little bit quieter than they were before. Remember, before we had them going, you know, 12 knots, and now we've reduced them down to 5 knots. So the first thing you notice is, remember the first time we did this, uh, we picked them right away? Take a look. <laughs> we got something. If you look extremely carefully, you can see this little tiny line here. If you look really, really carefully, you can actually see this little tiny line right here. Um, we're basically hopeless here. Not that we're blind or anything like that, but we utterly cannot pick anything. I mean, obviously, my sonar guy is fantastic, and he's probably got a good pair of headphones on, and he's listening. He can hear the swish, 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 swish. But notice the difference in volume is incredible here. Now, if we go to narrow band, this is where we're really in trouble. Take a look here. So remember before how we were able to identify the sub very, very obviously by its spectra? Now notice how little of the actual spectra we have in order to work with here. Um, before when we had this, we had tons and tons and tons of spectra. Now we barely have any. So I'm going to go ahead and assign a tracker here. And uh, like if I go to display signature, we can guess it's any one of these submarines. Obviously it's a Delta IV. But notice we can't actually identify what flavor it is because the spectra up here is different. So you can see that not only going faster made it easier to detect, but it also made it easier to identify. So I'm going to go ahead and get my auto crew here. We're going to pop back here. And notice it didn't take them long to identify these three sources as being some sort of subsurface contact. So we were still successful at actually identifying the actual target itself. Now, where things get interesting, this is all one of the fun things to do, especially like when you're in a game like this, is you can play with things like this. So I'm actually going to order him to go ahead and I go a little bit deeper here. And now the purpose of this is just to show you what's going to happen to the properties of sound as we get a little bit lower. And stop. All right, so notice that my sounds, it's not that the sound, the volume of the other submarines has got louder, although obviously it's gotten closer. It's that the noise in the background has started to come down. And when I actually come over here, like I said to my little toad array, notice how much more obvious they are on the narrow band display now compared to what they were before, making them vastly, vastly easier to identify. So again, just an interesting little thing. And remember, by the way, in this game, your toad array actually has to catch up to you. It's not instantaneous like it is over in uh, command. So what does TMA look like? I know you're going to ask. I just want to share this with you so you can see how crazy TMA actually is. So if I select, uh, let's see here, we want Sonar 06 seems to be one they have really, really good. I mean, while we're here, right? Let's go to Sonar 06. Boop. And you can see exactly what's going on here. These are all my running bearings. And this little line with the green thing is basically simulating my expected speed, my expected heading on it. And I'm trying to basically merge it with this little neat little chart here. This is an amazing process. Not today. So hopefully you saw a couple different interesting things today. Like I said, you had the opportunity to see what it looks like over in command, see how we were able to identify, see how we were able to kind of move it.
bit. Keep in mind, different submarines are louder than others, and keep in mind, different water conditions will cause different things to happen as well. Other than that, enjoy.